Hello and welcome to Through the Bible with Les Feldick. An Oklahoma rancher and farmer, Les Feldick has been teaching homestyle Bible classes for 20 years in Iowa, Oklahoma, and Texas. Les Feldick's unique style of Bible teaching has made the books of the Bible come to life. When Les is teaching, it's so interesting that people say time just seems to fly by. And now, here is Les Feldick. Okay, and again, we're going to come right back and carry on our discussion of all that was completed when Christ died and shed his blood, was buried, and rose from the dead. So you can be turning with me now. We're going to look at the atonement aspect as it was covered in the Old Testament, the Day of Atonement. So those of you here in the studio, you can turn with me to Leviticus chapter 16. And again, for those of you on television, we always like to welcome you into our classroom, and we trust that you'll take your Bible and your pen and follow us along, because we've always said we don't want you to hear what I say, but we want you to see what the book says. And uh, even if you may not agree with me, I don't expect everyone to just take everything I say and swallow it, but uh, hopefully if we can just raise your dander a little bit and you'll get into the book and, and study and see if what I say is right. And if you're convinced that I'm wrong, then if you're comfortable with it, well, that's fine. Uh, but I just have to teach it as I see it and trust that the Lord will bless hearts by it. And we know from our mail and from our phone calls that a lot of hearts are indeed. In fact, one of the gentlemen here today was saying, my, he said, how long I've prayed for someone to come that could open the word. And he says, you're it. Well, I said, had a phone call from a gentleman out in uh, North Carolina. And he basically said the same thing. He said, Les, for three years I prayed, Lord, send me somebody that can open this book. And he says, you're it. And uh, he's also sending the tapes clear over to the Philippines and Hong Kong. And uh, so anyway, the word is getting out and a lot of hearts we trust are seeing a lot of things they never saw before. Leviticus chapter 16 the Day of Atonement, as again it was begun back in the days shortly after they came out of Egypt, the same as all the other feast days, Passover and first fruits and uh, unleavened bread and all the rest of them. But as I mentioned in one of the other programs, you want to always remember that Passover was the feast in the spring, the reminder or the memorial of the night of the Passover in Egypt when the death angel flew over and they were protected by the blood. But atonement was in the fall, and the present name, as most of you are acquainted of it in the English, is Yom Kippur. Now, Yom Kippur is a far better definition or explanation of it than atonement. Because, you see, back here in Leviticus, the word atonement is really a misnomer. I don't think the English translator should have called it the Day of Atonement because there was no atonement. Animal bloods couldn't take away sin, and that's what atonement speaks of. Uh, you can split the word into three sections. It's at one meant, and that, that's a good definition. Atonement is the at one meant. Well, there's no way a man can become one with God until he has experienced the resurrection power and the finished work of the cross, and that hadn't happened back here yet. So the blood of animals couldn't take away sin, but all they could do was cover them. And the Hebrew word that is translated atonement was kafar. It's spelled uh, K-A-P-H-A-R in the English, and uh, the Hebrew pronunciation is more or less K-A-W-F-A-R, kafar, as I can understand translation. Now, I know I've got Jewish people listening to my program. They may call and say, hey, you just totally goofed up the pronunciation on that. That, that could be. But anyway, the word kafar meant to cover. In fact, it was associated with when they would cover something with bitumen. They would kafar it. Now, do you see, get the picture? And so, the Day of Atonement was not a day of removing the sin of Israel. That couldn't happen with animal's blood, but it was a covering. Now, if you know your Bible, you remember that David in the Psalm says, Blessed is the man whose sins are what? Covered covered. 
they weren't done away with. They couldn't be. And now, you know, that, that again, that opens up another whole can of worms, if you want to use that expression. But you see, that's why the Old Testament believer couldn't go into glory when he died. His sins weren't atoned for. They were covered. And what were they waiting for? The true atoning work of the cross. And so then, after the cross, after the, the supreme sacrifice, the divine blood had been shed, then their sins were atoned for. And then, as we taught here several months ago, God took paradise up into heaven. But before that, the Old Testament believer went down into paradise. He couldn't go into the presence of God because his sins weren't atoned for. They were only covered. All right, so let's look at this day of atonement and how Christ now then fulfilled all of these pictures back here when he went to the cross on our behalf. Chapter 16. I'm not going to take all this verse by verse. It'd take too long. But verse 1, The Lord spake unto Moses after the death of the two sons of Aaron, when they offered before the Lord and died. And he said unto Moses, Speak unto Aaron thy brother, that he come not at all times or every day into the holy place within or behind the veil before the mercy seat which is upon the ark, that he die not. For I will appear in the cloud upon the mercy seat. If you remember our tabernacle study, the mercy seat was on the top of the Ark of the Covenant, overshadowed by the wings of the uh, seraphim, was it? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, it was the seraphim, wasn't it? And uh, it was there that the Shekinah glory was upon. That was the very presence of God. And they could only go into that behind the veil once a year on this Day of Atonement. <clears throat> now, here are the preparations that the priest, again, had to go through. Now, watch the analogy. Even as the Passover lamb had to be perfect, without blemish, so also this high priest has to go through the whole ritual of cleansing. Now, look at it. Uh, verse 3. Thus shall Aaron, the high priest, of course, come into the holy place behind the veil, with a young bullock for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. Now, he didn't take the animal, of course. He took only the blood. Verse 4. He shall put on the holy linen coat. Now, what does linen speak of in Scripture? Righteousness, cleanliness. He shall put on the holy linen coat, and he shall have the linen breeches upon his flesh, and he shall be girded with a linen girdle, and with the linen miter shall he be attired. These are holy garments. And therefore shall he wash his flesh in water and then put them on. Now, not only was his clothing, the, the linen, impeccable, not a spot, not a wrinkle, but also his own body of flesh had to be washed so that everything was impeccably clean. Now, what does that speak of our high priest? The same way. He was clean. He was without spot. He was without blemish. All right, now then, let's move on quickly. Verse 5, He was to take of the congregation of the children of Israel two kids for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. And we're not going to pay so much attention to them. We're going to deal with Aaron, the high priest. Verse 6, And Aaron shall offer his bullock of the sin offering, which is for himself, and make an atonement is the English, and I again prefer to go back to the Hebrew word, a covering, a kafar, for himself and for his house. Verse 7, he shall take the two goats and present them before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Now watch verse 8. Now remember, he's got two goats and a ram or a bullock. That is for himself. Now, he's also had a couple for the children of Israel, but let, let's just look at the three and keep it as simple here as we can. Now, with the two goats, he was to cast lots or draw straws, however you want to put it, upon the two goats. One goat was to be a lot for the Lord, that it would be sacrificed. What was to happen to the other one? It was to remain alive for a scapegoat. We still use the term today. What is a scapegoat? Well, he's the, he's the poor fellow that takes the blame for the wrongs and the sins of someone else. 
All right? So now he's got the two goats and his own bullock. The one goat has been designated to be the scapegoat. This one is going to have to be for a sacrifice. Now then, verse 9. He shall bring the goat upon which the Lord's lot fell and offer him for a sin offering. But the goat on which the lot fell to be the scapegoat shall be presented alive before the Lord to make an atonement or a covering with him and to let him go for a scapegoat where? Into the wilderness. Now we can't understand here in our part of beautiful Oklahoma, we can't comprehend the barren wilderness of Judea and maybe even some of the Middle Eastern desert country. I mean, it is wilderness, uninhabitable, God forsaken, if I may use the term. Now, this live goat then, over which the sins of Israel would be symbolically placed, he was taken alive, clear out into the unknown, untracked wilderness, and let go. The other goat was immediately killed, and the blood was used then for a sprinkling on the mercy seat behind the veil. But only one man in Israel could do all this. And who was it? The high priest. He alone could go in behind the veil and sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat. He alone could lay his hands on that scapegoat and symbolically place all the sins of Israel upon that scapegoat. Now that was the work of the high priest. Now, I'm going to bring you back a moment again to Genesis. Put all this on hold for just a second. Genesis 14. Genesis 14. We all go all the way back to Abraham. And he has just pursued the kings that had overrun Lot's hometown of Sodom, conquers them, and brings Lot and his family, of course, back to Sodom. But on his way back, in the area of present-day Jerusalem, a strange thing happens, doesn't it? Verse 17 of Genesis 14. Genesis 14, verse 17, And the king of Sodom went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Chedorlaomer, and the kings that were with him at the valley of Shava, which is the king's dale. Now verse 18, And Melchizedek, the king of Salem, now you remember I'm always pointing out that's the last five letters of Jerusalem, so it's the same little village, the same area. So the king of Salem, or Jerusalem, brought forth bread and wine. Now that's unusual, isn't it? You didn't use bread and wine in the tabernacle worship. Bread and wine was never alluded to in, in the Old Testament economy. So where are we already leaping to? Well, to the death, burial, and resurrection. The bread and wine spoke of his broken body and his shed blood. Now, of course, Abraham, I'm sure, had no concept of what Melchizedek was doing. But God did. God knew the end from the beginning. And so now this man, Melchizedek, brought forth bread and wine. He was a what? A priest. Not a priest of Judaism. Not a priest of Moses and Aaron, but he was a priest of the Most High God. Now, here again is why I say the Bible is so intricate in its makeup. Whenever the term Most High God is used, that is a reference not just to Israel, but predominantly to the non-Jewish world. The Most High God. And you'll see that in Daniel when Nebuchadnezzar referred to the God of Daniel. He didn't call him Jehovah, he called him the Most High. Well, he was a Gentile. And so all, all these things have their purpose in Scripture, that now the Most High God is not just the God of Israel, he's the God of all. Melchizedek is not just the high priest of Israel. Israel isn't even on the scene yet. So he's the high priest of whom? The whole human race. He is a picture, then, of the priesthood that Christ would fulfill. All right, now then, on the Day of Atonement, 
the high priest would have to go in behind the veil, sprinkle the blood of the sacrificial goat on the mercy seat, and then he'd come out and symbolically lay the sins of Israel on the scapegoat. Now let's go all the way back up to Hebrews again, and our time is flying. Hebrews chapter 9. Verse 11, Hebrews 9, verse 11. But Christ, being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, in other words, his tabernacle, his place of the sprinkling would not be here on earth, but it'd be in heaven. Verse 12, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once, not once a year, but once for all, into the holy place. Again, that's that place in the very throne room or the very presence of God having obtained, that is, by his shed blood, eternal redemption for us. All right, now if you'll back up a chapter or two in Hebrews to chapter 7. Verse 1, For this Melchizedek, who of course is referred to up there in verse 20, well, better read verse 20 of chapter 6, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Not after the order of Aaron, but after Melchizedek. Now remember, Melchizedek was also the king of Salem, the city of peace, but he was the priest of the Most High God. Now, we pointed this out and we were way back in our Genesis teaching, but that's almost four years ago, so a lot of you folk haven't uh, been in and all that. But you see, there had to be a high priest, not just for the Jew, but for the whole Gentile world as well. And so this Melchizedek is the priest of the Most High God, which of course is, like I said, indicating predominantly the Gentile aspect. But he also is going to be the high priest of the Jew, not just of Gentile, of all. And that's what Melchizedek was. He was the high priest of all. And so Christ's high priest is not after the order of Aaron, but after the order of Melchizedek. All right, let's come on down to, uh, oh, let me see, I'm trying to save some time. Verse 12. No, verse 11, if therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, that is, under the Mosaic system, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? See, there had to be a reason. For the priesthood being changed, there is a made of necessity a change also the law. Verse 13, for he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar, for it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, not Levi. See, no one under the Mosaic priesthood could be a priest unless he was from the tribe of Levi. But our Lord didn't come from Levi, he came from Judah. All right, now let's read on. Verse 15, and it is yet far more evident, for after the similitude of Melchizedek, the high priest of all, before Israel is even a nation, so after the order of, or the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, that is the law of Moses, but after the power of an endless life. So who are we looking forward to? The Christ. And so in his eternalness, in his omnipotence, 
in his being a priest after the order of Melchizedek, who was without beginning and without end, without genealogy, without father, without mother. It's after that order that Christ now then becomes our high priest. All right, so how did he fulfill the role of the high priest? Now I'm going to bring you all the way back to John's Gospel, and I imagine I'll run out of time, but we'll try. John's Gospel, chapter 20. And if we indeed take the time to teach a few lessons out of John, we may have time to look at this more in depth. But here on the resurrection morning now, and you all know the account, how that Mary Magdalene went and uh, was aghast. The tomb was empty. And so she quickly runs and tells Peter and John, who evidently had spent the night not too far away. And so they both run to the sepulcher, and you know the account. And uh, we referred to this verse 9 in our earlier program. When they saw the tomb was empty, then they saw all the evidence that he must have supernaturally been raised from the dead. Then they, for the first time, believed and understood the Scriptures. But then you come down verse 11 through 16. We have the account of Mary and the Lord. And, uh, oh, let's see, I guess I start at verse 11. Mary stood without at the sepulcher, weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked in and seized two angels in white sitting, the one at the head and the other at the feet, where the body of Jesus had lain. And they say unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? And she said unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. Does she understand yet? No, she has no comprehension. And when she had thus said, she turned herself back and saw Jesus standing and knew not that it was Jesus. Now, you remember a couple programs ago I pointed out from Isaiah that his visage would be so marred, so contorted, so disfigured that that's the way Mary expected him if she were to see him after all this had happened. But here she sees a normal appearance of a human being Nothing grotesque about it whatsoever. And she turned herself back, knowing not it was Jesus. Then verse 15, Jesus said unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? And she, supposing him to be the gardener. Now, I always have to emphasize the point here. He didn't look bizarre. He didn't look like a ghost. He looked very human. He looked very normal. And she just assumed that he was a gardener. All right, and she says, Sir, if you have borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. And then verse 16, Jesus said unto her, Mary, can't you hear him? Mary, and oh, it just rung bells. And then she knew who it was. And she turned herself and said unto him, Rabboni, which is to say master. And according to the next verse, she was evidently going to embrace him, so thrilled to see him alive after all he'd gone through. But he holds her at bay with a word. And he says to her, verse 17, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father, but go to my brethren, go to the disciples, and tell them that I ascend unto my Father, to your Father, to my God and your God. Now then, what's he doing? Well, he ascends in that moment of time while Mary runs to tell the twelve. And then when they come back and they all meet him, of course, he tells them to touch him, to check out his wounds and so forth. But to Mary, he says, touch me not, for I have not yet ascended. Well, he had to ascend in the impeccableness again of that high priest. Now, that's why I cover all that. That high priest had to be spotless. And Jesus couldn't even be touched by the hands of a lady like uh, Mary. Mary Magdalene, wasn't it? Or Martha, forgotten already. But anyway, he says, touch me not. He could not be defiled by human hands. Now I'll come back again to where we were a moment ago in Hebrews, and hopefully we can wind all this up in the minute or two that's left. Hebrews chapter 9, once again, verse 11. I can't repeat this often enough. Now, as the high priest, after the order of Melchizedek, not after the order of Aaron, that would have been only for the Jew, but since he's the high priest after the order of Melchizedek, 
He covers the whole spectrum of humanity. You and I, black and white, red and yellow, rich or poor. That was the priesthood of Melchizedek. And as such, verse 11, Christ being come a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, that one was in heaven. Now remember back in uh, Exodus when Moses was given the instructions to build that tabernacle? What was it patterned after? The one in heaven. All right, now it's the one in heaven that Jesus has entered into, verse 12, not with the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered in once into the holy place, having obtained. All right, got two minutes, and I'm going to cover that point that I left you hanging in the last program. Come back again to Matthew 27, and we have to look at those three hours between... Oh, now she puts up one minute. Oh, boy. <laughs> those three hours between high noon and three o'clock in the afternoon, where there was darkness, total silence not a word from the cross. Now, you remember the scapegoat? It was left alive. Between 12 and 3, Jesus is still what? Alive. What do you think he becomes? I think the scapegoat. Now, where was the scapegoat sent? Into the wilderness. Now, what I like to think, and I may be wrong, but I'll tell you it's food for thought. In those three hours, he stepped out of time as the body hung on the cross, in soul and spirit, he stepped out of time into eternity and suffered the punishment for all of mankind's sin. Now remember, eternity you can cover a million years in 30 seconds. That's eternity. And so I feel that in that three hours, he stepped into the eternal and suffered the punishment for every human being's sin as the scapegoat, taking our sins far, far away, never to be remembered against us anymore. Then he comes back, three o'clock in the afternoon, and he finishes his statements from the cross, and then he can say, it is finished. Thank you for watching Through the Bible with Les Feldick a weekly Bible study. If you would like more information about the Les Feldick Ministries, a Bible study in your area, or about this program, write to Les Feldick Ministries, Route 1, Box 760.